Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Let's Talk About Health, a community conversation about important health topics. I'm Donna Jacobs, Senior Vice President at the University of Maryland Medical System, and I will be your moderator today. Our webinar series is designed to increase awareness about important health issues, provide people with tools that can help them maintain or improve their health or that of their family, and improve patient and provider communication. To that end, parts of this conversation are framed in ways that we believe can help people have productive conversations with their providers, including exactly what questions you should ask when talking with your medical uh, worker. UMS conducts a community health conversation in this virtual webinar format once a month, every third Wednesday at noon, so people can participate during the lunch hour. Our topic today is really popular from the registration. It is dementia, a set of diseases that impact a large portion of our population, especially as people age. This can be devastating and taxing for both the patient and the family. Leading our conversation today is Dr. Adam Rosenblatt. Dr. Rosenblatt is a graduate of Yale University and the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. He completed his psychiatric residency at Johns Hopkins and initially served on the faculty of the Hopkins School of Medicine as Associate Professor of Psychiatry. He then moved to Virginia Commonwealth University where he served as Professor of Psychiatry and Neurology and the Director of Geriatric Psychiatry. Following that, he came back to Maryland where he is now the Clinical Director of Inpatient Psychiatry and Geriatric Psychiatry at the University of Maryland Upper Chesapeake Health Services in Harford County. And he also is, again, an adjunct professor of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins. Dr. Rosenblatt is a prolific writer and researcher. He's authored over 85 peer-reviewed scientific papers, eight book chapters, and the second and third edition of a book entitled A Physician's Guide to Huntington's Disease. His research interests include dementia and behavioral health problems in long-term care. Because these sessions are intended to be interactive conversations, please feel free to use the Q&A, the question and answer box, to type in questions that you may have as Dr. Rosenblatt is speaking, and he'll be happy to respond to as many questions as we have time for during this session. His slides will be available to you in just a few days. I'll explain more on that later, and that's so you don't have to copiously um, take notes, copiously or furiously take notes as he begins and as he speaks. So, Dr. Rosenblatt, please, the floor is yours. You might be on mute. There we go. Thank you very much for having me, everyone. Uh, this is a topic very near and dear to my heart. And I'm going to try to um, uh, um, not use a lot of uh, uh, technical terms, but put this in, in, in uh, terms that everybody can plainly understand. But I want to address some very important misconceptions about dementia that I think are out there and that really get in people's way. So let me begin by defining it. Um, dementia is an acquired global decline in cognitive function. So by acquired, we mean that the person wasn't born with it. So if you're born with some kind of condition that causes intellectual disability, that's not the same thing as dementia. Um, global meaning that it doesn't only affect memory. So people think of it as being a memory problem, and um, a memory problem is certainly a big part of it. But there's also problems in other uh, cognitive areas. So people have trouble with things like naming things or carrying out multi-step tasks, or they may have trouble with judgment or they may have various behavioral problems. Uh, so it's not only memory, there's a, there, it's a whole global picture. Um, and it's very dependent on age. So dementia is very common in the elderly. About a, a tenth of the population over age 65 has some form of dementia, and about a third of the population over age 80 has some form of dementia. Most of the types of dementia, uh, with Alzheimer's disease being the most common type, are progressive. So unfortunately, once the diagnosis is made, it's probably going to get worse gradually over time. There are some kinds that aren't progressive. So for example, if you were hit in the head by a falling brick and you suffered an injury to your brain, 
you might have dementia after that, but that probably wouldn't be progressive. But most of the common kinds of dementia are, and it's very, very expensive. So the, the 2018 figures are that dementia probably cost the, the United States about $277 billion. Um, and over the course of five years, the cost per family is about $287,000. Now, if you compare that to other common health problems, heart disease only costs about $175,000 and cancer only about $173,000. Um, so you can see that dementia is, is a very costly uh, diagnosis, both to families uh, and to the country. And a lot of those costs come in the form of uh, increased need for care, uh, lost wages when families take care of somebody that has it, people that need to go into hospitals or nursing homes or assisted livings, uh, those kinds of things. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, let me talk about what dementia is not, and here's, here are some of the misconceptions. So dementia should not be regarded as a normal part of aging. It's certainly a common disease of the elderly, but it's, it shouldn't be regarded as normal. You know, if you go to a room full of doctors, a lot of people are wearing these things, eyeglasses. But it doesn't mean that myopia, you know, which is what I suffer from or nearsightedness, uh, is normal. It's an eye disease. Um, it's, just a, it's just a common one. I can only... um, um, and uh, uh, as, as a disease process, it's different from age-related cognitive changes. So as people age, they do suffer some cognitive changes. Uh, you know, they may have a little bit more difficulty recalling events. Uh, their ability to solve problems may be a little bit slowed down. And we hope that's replaced by some positive things, namely wisdom as people get older and life experience. Um, and so it's sort of like a child falling off their growth curve. So if any of you have children and you've gone to a pediatrician, um, the pediatrician measures your child's age and weight, and they plot it on a growth chart. And so if your child is uh, kind of short, so maybe at the 25th percentile, then they t tend to stay like that throughout their life. And, and if they're tall, you know, at the 90th percentile, they tend to stay like that throughout their life. So if you have a child that has always been on the tall end, and then all of a sudden they drop from being in the tallest 10% of people to being in the shortest, you'd say, oh, something is wrong. You'd call that growth retardation, and you'd look into why has this child stopped growing. So it's like that. You know, adults have a sort of a cognitive curve, and so there's there's and we have um, figures that we know how people should perform. So if, if you're tested, for example, and you're 85 years old and you have a college degree, we have some expectation what an 85-year-old college-educated person would test out like. And when somebody falls off that predicted curve, like a child falling off their growth curve, then you would say there's probably something going wrong. There's something happening now. Um, and uh, um, as I said before, dementia is a blanket term. So it just refers to an acquired global decline in cognitive function. And then there are specific diseases that are types of dementia. And the most common one is Alzheimer's disease, and I'm gonna name for you in a minute some other uh, diseases that are also under that heading of dementia. Uh, so one misconception I, I encounter a lot is that people think that dementia just refers to the normal age-related changes that we all have, and that Alzheimer's disease is something special. But in fact, they're really all part of the same process. So I've had people say, uh, um, you know, somebody might come to me and they clearly are suffering from cognitive impairment. And I'll say, well, did you see another doctor? And they say, yeah. And uh, they, we talked about my memory problem. And I said, did they use the word Alzheimer's disease? And they'll say, oh, no, no, definitely not that. They said dementia, you know, like you see in old people, just a regular kind. Um, so there is no regular kind. You know, dementia is a term like fever or infection that, that's not specific to a, to a particular disease. The other misconception is that um, it's true that most forms of dementia are not curable, but it doesn't mean that they're untreatable. So there are a number of medications, and there are a lot of things that we can do in terms of how to interact with somebody and what supports to put in place and what to do about behavioral problems that can really turn things around. The world is full of incurable diseases. So we can't cure diabetes. We can't cure emphysema. Uh, you know, a lot of things like that. We can't cure osteoporosis, but we have treatments for all these diseases, and, and these are chronic diseases that can be managed by medical treatment, and people's lives can be improved, even though we can't take them away. Um, and then the last thing that I think is a common misunderstanding is that uh, depression is a pretty common problem in people with dementia, but it shouldn't be dismissed as being understandable. So sometimes the depression is another disease that needs uh, medical treatment and other 
situations, the prisons become demoralized because of their situation and the things that they can't do. But but we shouldn't just say, oh, who wouldn't be depressed if they had dementia? That's a depressing condition. Because it's certainly possible to have a happy life even though you have dementia. It's not the same thing as, as misery. And so if somebody is uh, suffering from dementia and they're also depressed, we shouldn't dismiss that. We should say, what can we do to improve that situation as well? Can I have the next slide, please? So as I mentioned before, there are a few types of dementia, and, and by far the most common type in the United States is Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's disease, um, uh, I'm going to describe for you in, in a little bit, but it's characterized by a kind of a what we call an insidious onset. It sneaks up on people. So um, I'll say to a family, I'm going to ask you a funny question. I'm not going to ask you when this started, and I'm not going to ask you what the first thing was that you noticed. I'll ask that in a little while. I want to ask you, is it easy to say when this began, or is it hard to say when this began? And if they all get into an argument about exactly when it began and they, you know, they disagree by a year, then that tells me that it's probably Alzheimer's disease because it has that sneaky onset where it's hard to tell exactly when it began. Uh, it's that subtle. And Alzheimer's disease tends to get gradually worse over time. Uh, the second most common kind of dementia in the United States is so-called vascular dementia. And you may have heard uh, somebody say that somebody's mother, father, you know, or brother or sister has mini strokes. And what they mean is that the person hasn't had a great big stroke where everybody noticed it. You know, maybe they collapsed while they were playing golf and half of their body was paralyzed. You know, something that, that everybody would recognize as a stroke. They mean that they've had little ones that they may not have even noticed the event. But if you look at the person's brain uh, um, under an MRI or a CAT scan, you'll see the evidence of these little areas of damage from blood vessels being blocked up by uh, these small strokes. Um, and that can lead to this condition called vascular dementia. And it's a little bit different from Alzheimer's disease. I'll go into it more in a minute, but it may have a, a not really sudden, but a little bit more uh, noticeable onset. You may really be able to clearly mark before and after it started. And instead of progressing very gradually and slowly, it tends to progress in a stepwise fashion so that the person will do okay for a while and then there'll be a sudden change and then they'll do okay and there'll be another sudden change. Um, and then there are some other rarer forms of dementia including Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia, the dementia associated with Parkinson's disease, and a condition called normal pressure hydrocephalus. And these kind of require a, a, a specialist to, to try to diagnose, uh, but, but you may have heard about them. And if they come up in questions and answers, we can talk about them some more. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So Alzheimer's disease, as I said, it tends to have a subtle onset and a gradual progressive course. People's short-term memory is usually worse than their long-term. So somebody with Alzheimer's disease might be able to tell you all about their wedding day or about when they served in the Navy or something like that, but might not be able to tell you what they have for breakfast or what day it is today. And people's personalities tend to be preserved in Alzheimer's disease compared to other forms of dementia. Uh, sometimes they might become kind of coarsened. So somebody who was always very anxious might be very, very anxious if they have Alzheimer's disease. Somebody who was always a little bit irritable might be very, very irritable. But usually the, the person's personality still comes through. Um, and Alzheimer's disease probably makes up about two-thirds to three-quarters of, of all the cases of dementia in the U.S. Um, now, you're going to hear sometimes that it's what they call a diagnosis of exclusion. And what that means is since it's hard to absolutely prove it, you want to think about whether you're missing something else. Uh, especially you want to think about whether you're missing something that might be reversible. So suppose the person has an infection and the infection is causing them to become delirious. Uh, that might be something that you could cure and it turns out they don't have Alzheimer's disease after all. Or maybe there are a few you know, rare vitamin deficiencies that can cause the person to be cognitively impaired and they could be cured by supplying the missing vitamin. So you want to make sure you're not missing that kind of thing, but most of the time that's not going to be the case. Um, you'll also hear that to be 100% certain of the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, you have to look at the person's brain under a microscope. Um, most people are never going to have an autopsy when they die, and that's certainly not an option while somebody's still alive. But what you need to know is that the diagnosis is about 90% accurate with the person still alive in their brain right in their head where it belongs. So um, sometimes I think if you have a doctor who is not comfortable with dementia or hasn't diagnosed it a lot or is 
uh, sort of nervous talking to people about it. They try to make the person better, feel better by, by not kind of being straightforward with them. And so I'll have families and I'll say, well, now, did the doctor say that it could be Alzheimer's disease? And they said, oh, the doctor said that you can only be sure of that at autopsy. And so we'll just never know. And, and they didn't tell you that, there's a, that if you use the right clinical criteria and you ask the right questions, you can be 90% accurate. That is, if we, if we make the diagnosis and then we wait for these people to pass away and we examine their brain under a microscope, 90% of the time we turn out to have been right with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And that's important because there are treatments for it that are specific to that disease. And so if we don't make the diagnosis, then how do we move forward with the treatment? So we try to exclude reversible causes like infections and vitamin deficiencies and things like that, but they usually don't turn out to be the case. And it's, it's a few simple tests that we usually do to make sure it isn't one of these reversible things. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Vascular dementia that I mentioned, they're likely to have a history of strokes or a lot of risk factors for strokes like high blood pressure and diabetes and that kind of thing. And it's less predictable, a kind of a stepwise deterioration where somebody might uh, be level for a while and then they suffer another loss and then level another loss. There's more likely to be personality changes in people with vascular dementia because we don't know exactly what part of the brain is going to be affected. Um, and uh, you might support the diagnosis by an imaging study like a CAT scan or an MRI that would show these areas of, of damage to the brain. Or if it's an option, by cognitive testing, you know, more formal than what you would do in an ordinary doctor's office, something that would be done by a psychologist who would uh, put the person through a bunch of pencil and paper tests. And so you might be able to um, pin down the diagnosis based on the kinds of deficits they have. And there's such a thing as mixed dementias. So there's lots of us running around that have um, stroke risk factors like diabetes or hypertension, and Alzheimer's is also very common. So sometimes a person could be unlucky enough to have a mixture of both kinds of dementia, and that might be hard to pin down also, but, uh, but it is a real thing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so there are a few things that can cause confusion in identifying dementia in somebody. One is that a dementia that's already there can be suddenly revealed. So the, the, the metaphor I use is think about a rock that's under the surface of a river. And when the water level is high, we don't know the rock is there. And when the water level is low, then we run our canoe up on the rock when we're trying to um, you know, float down that river. Um, and so sometimes a person may have a mild case of dementia that just hasn't been noticed by anybody yet. And then something comes along and it lowers the water level. You know, like the person uh, becomes delirious with a urinary infection and their dementia becomes much more obvious. Obvious. Uh, or um, their spouse gets sick and goes into the hospital and the spouse that was covering for our patient, uh, you know, had taken over paying the bills, had taken over doing most of the driving, had taken over doing the cooking, isn't there. And we suddenly realize that the person who's at home can't do those things for themselves anymore. Uh, or they move to a new area and they don't know anybody and they don't, they don't have a routine and they get more confused. I've had a lot of times where a, an adult child went to visit their parent, maybe they had retired to Florida or South Carolina or something, and they find that the parent is not doing well. You know, I remember one guy went to see his father in Florida and his father um, wasn't keeping up the house. He wasn't eating regularly. He wasn't taking his medicine. And he realized that he was suffering from dementia. So he moved him up to Baltimore to live with him. And um, it started out as a disaster. And he said, my father's up in the middle of the night. He's confused. He doesn't know what's happening. He's getting agitated with me. I thought I was going to be helping. I thought I'd be moving him in with me and I could look after him. And I said, well, you did the right thing because he was really in a dangerous situation in Florida, but he's a lot more confused because he doesn't know any of this place. You know, he has no routine. He doesn't know your house, your neighborhood. He, he, he's not getting up at the same time. Uh, everything's unfamiliar to him. And so you're going to see a lot more confusion. Um, and there's a lot of denial and procrastination about dementia. I mean, I've had people in my own family where I've said to their adult children, you know, I think your mom's developing dementia. And they're like, uh, oh, no, she's just getting old. You know, it's going to be fine. And then, you know, a year later, they're really in a bad situation. So it's not a good idea to wait until it becomes an emergency. Uh, you don't want to wait until the person stops paying the, the, the power bill or has a car accident or stops taking their heart medicine. You know, if you suspect it, there may be something to that, and you should help the person get an evaluation, get an accurate diagnosis. Even doctors avoid talking about dementia. The, we didn't receive, you know, e even at a good med school like, like Johns Hopkins, 
We didn't receive a lot of training on how to discuss that uncomfortable topic with people. And I think the best thing to do is to be honest about it, but be supportive at the same time. Um, you're usually not telling people anything that they haven't already suspected. And so I just give it a name and I say, you know, we already knew that there was a problem. I'm just giving it a name. But but by doing that, I want you to know that that I'm here to help with your treatment. And there's a lot of things that we can do about it. So I'm not just giving you bad news and then walking out of your life. I'm giving you news that you kind of expected to hear. And now I'm going to suggest things that we can do to help. Um, specialists can be hard to come by. Some dementia specialists are psychiatrists like me. Some of them are neurologists. Some of them are uh, geriatricians, which are doctors that specialize in the care of the elderly. Uh, there are other kinds of dementia specialists as well, but there's never going to be enough of us. And so that's why I try to spend a lot of time educating members of the public and educating other doctors about this condition uh, so that everybody can pitch in. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, this is about the Ask Me Three system, uh, which is a program that suggests three simple, straightforward questions when talking to your doctor, nurse, pharmacist, or healthcare provider about your health. Or in the case of dementia, it may be you talking to them about the health of a family member, a spouse, a parent, a brother or sister, something like that. So the three things to ask are, what is my main problem? What do I need to do? And why is it important for me to do this? And so I'm going to show you this with a few examples about how topics and dementia might come up, and you could use the Ask Me Three system for that. Next slide, please. So here's an example. Uh, here's a statement of the problem. Uh, this is an imaginary patient's daughter or son. Uh, my 85-year-old mother was just diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. I'm 62, and I'm worried I will get it too. So what is the problem? The problem is people with a parent with AD, which is Alzheimer's disease, are, are in fact more likely to develop that condition, although it's far from 100%. So it is not destiny, uh, but, but you do have an increased risk if you have a parent with the condition, and the risk goes up if you have both parents with the condition. So what do I need to do? So what could a person do who knows that they have a somewhat increased risk? They can minimize those risk factors that are preventable. So now would be a great time to quit smoking and take steps to control your blood pressure because having stroke risk factors like hypertension or being a smoker increase your risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. Why is it important for me to do this? Even delaying the onset could provide years of disease-free life. It might give new treatments a chance to catch up. So let's suppose that you're, quote, supposed to get Alzheimer's disease at 80, but instead you take so many precautions that you're, it doesn't happen until you're 85. Well, first of all, Five more years is a terrific thing. Uh, second of all, there's people working every day on treatments, and maybe in that five-year gap, somebody comes up with a new treatment for you. So anything you could do that might delay the onset is in your interest, especially when the playing field is shifting like that. Next slide, please. Uh, so what are things that can be done for prevention? There's no 100% guaranteed way to prevent it. And there's a lot of people making a lot of money selling a lot of things to people, you know, offering promises that I think are unrealistic. But the things that I think there's pretty strong scientific evidence for is you want to minimize your risk factors for a stroke. So if you have hypertension, you want to treat it. If your cholesterol is high, you want to treat it. If you have diabetes, you want to treat it. You want to avoid smoking. You want to avoid excessive alcohol intake, and you want to avoid head injuries. Um, those are the things that I think there's very solid evidence for. And then there's a possible role for positive lifestyle factors. You know, instead of what do I avoid, what can I actually do? There's a fair amount of evidence that physical exercise seems to help uh, to delay the onset of dementia uh, or, or uh, um, slow its progression. Um, and uh, there's some evidence that mental stimulation is good for that. That's a little hard to tease out because if you have a big giant brain and you love doing Sudoku and crossword puzzles and, and learning new languages and things like that, that might just mean that you have a big giant brain. And so you have more brain to spare. And so if that big giant brain then becomes uh, affected by Alzheimer's disease, you won't show it as readily as someone else. You know, just like if you're in incredible physical condition and you've got great big muscles and then you develop a disease that causes your muscles to waste, you're going to stay stronger, longer than someone else. It's not clear if you take somebody that was never interested in crossword puzzles in the first place and make them do them, whether it's going to change their dementia. But many people believe it might, and it's pretty harmless as long as you're not spending a ton of money or making yourself feel bad about the fact you're not very good at crossword puzzles. So there's probably a role for mental stimulation as well. Next slide, please. And there are medicines to improve cognitive function. There are four drugs that have been approved by the FDA for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, and some of them for 
um, slightly different kinds of dementia as well. Um, I think probably the most popular one is still Aricep. Uh, its generic name is Dinepazil. There's also Exelon uh, or Rivastigmine, uh, which comes in a patch form. Uh, that patch form is very nice because uh, it really gets around the, uh, the uh, GI upset and upset stomachs caused by some of these drugs, but it's a patch, which is a little bit of a hassle. Uh, there's a drug called Razodine or Galantamine. Those three all belong to a family called the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. You don't need to know that, but they all belong to the same family. And then there's the drug Nemenda or Mamantine, which belongs to a different family, and it's sometimes combined with one of these other drugs. Um, the effects could be modest, uh, but the treatment is important, and it requires some faith. So if you look at that graph over there, it's kind of interesting. What you can see is um, the, the, the x-axis, the the, the left to right is time going by. And so this looks at people up to a year. And then the, the, the y-axis, the up and down part, is a cognitive score on something called the mini mental, which is a common um, uh, cognitive instrument where they give the person about a five, 10 minute test to the doctor's office and you get a score between one and 30. So you can see um, the average, uh, the red line on top is the people taking denepazil, and the white line on the bottom is the people that were given a placebo. So you can see that the people taking the episode did better than the people that took the placebo. But what you might notice if you look at it closely is they only went up about one point. Um, uh, that's less important than the difference between them, right? So the people taking the placebo get worse. But you'll see the people taking the drug, they also got worse over time. And by the end of this year, they're doing slightly worse than they were when they started out, but quite a bit better than the people on the placebo. So if, if someone in your family is taking this medicine, they may have a rip-roaring response, and it may be very obvious, and that happens sometimes. But a lot of the time, you're not going to be 100% sure. And you'll go into the doctor's office, and they might repeat this this uh, instrument again, and they might come up a point, and you could be, is it really working? I'm not 100% sure. That's where the faith comes in. You know, there's a lot of medical conditions like that, too. Suppose you take calcium for your osteoporosis and you don't break a hip this year. Is that because you took the half calcium or are you just lucky? Suppose you take an aspirin to prevent strokes and you don't have a stroke this year. Is that because the aspirin worked or did you just get lucky? It can be hard to tell. So you may really see a big change on one of the medicines, and that happens to me all the time when I treat patients with this. But sometimes it's going to be subtle, and, uh, and you're just going to have to say, well, I can afford it. He's tolerating it. But we know from studies that if you give it to large numbers of people, the people on the medicine do better than the people on the placebo. It's not always going to be totally obvious. Next slide, please. Uh, so here's another Ask Me Free. My wife has Alzheimer's disease, and her doctor prescribed medication to improve her memory, but she doesn't seem any better. So this is an illustration of what I've just been talking about. So what is the problem? Not everyone responds to medication, and the response can be modest. What do I need to do? Improvements can be important, but too subtle to notice day to day. So ask the doctor what quantitative scales he or she is using to measure success. Hey, doc, do you have any proof that my wife is doing better on this medicine? And the doctor will say, oh, your guess is as good as mine. And you'd say, well, did you do a quantitative scale like the mini mental? Do you have, you know, it's like trying to treat blood pressure without using a blood pressure cuff. Um, why is it important for me to do this? Successful treatment can preserve function, improve behavior, and reduce burden. But if it is not working, it's time to move on to another idea. So, you know, these drugs aren't free. You want to know if there's any evidence that it's working or if there's evidence that it's not working and you want to make a decision. Maybe we need to change to something else or save money or move on, move on to a different treatment. Next slide, please. Uh, other medicines used for people with dementia, uh, some people take antidepressant medicine for depressive symptoms. Uh, some people take antipsychotic medication. You're really kind of in specialist territory now. You know, these are drugs like Risperdal and Haldol and that sort of thing. And they, they're associated with an increased risk of mortality in elderly people with dementia. Um, so you want to be careful about them, have very good reason for using them. And if you're going to use them, you want to make sure that they seem to be helping and not just continue if it's not doing anything. And drugs that are referred to as mood stabilizers are sometimes used to try to help people to agitated behavior. You want to be very careful about medications that cause confusion. Tranquilizers and sleeping pills, for example, are almost always a bad idea in elderly people with dementia because they tend to make things worse. And you want to ask the doctor about the Beers list. So Dr. Beers was a very famous doctor who worked with the elderly. He was a geriatrician. And he came up with a list of medications that are risky to give to elderly people. Uh, either because they cause delirium or because um, your aging kidneys and liver don't metabolize them well or they don't mix well with, 
with other medicines and conditions. And this list is always being updated. And so a doctor who treats the elderly should know about such a thing and should be thinking about it. So, for example, there's a drug called Ditropan that's used uh, for urinary incontinence, and it can make people delirious. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, the same people who you would want to give it to might be the same people that it's particularly risky. In. And so that's an example of a medicine that, that you want to be careful of uh, with elderly people, especially if they have dementia. Next slide, please. Uh, depression is very prevalent. Uh, maybe as many as a quarter of people with Alzheimer's disease will suffer from it at some point. And it's characterized by sadness and a loss of enjoyment, a sense of poor health and poor self-esteem. People feel sick. They feel exhausted. They feel bad about themselves. If you have dementia, you may not have the world's most typical presentation of this. So patients with dementia, depending on how bad it is, may not be able to describe their feelings very well. So you may have to look at other things like, have they stopped eating? Are they losing weight? Are they crying? Are they agitated? And think about whether the person's ever had depression before, whether there's a strong history in the family of depression, or whether there have been any life events that might have set this off. And uh, to treat it successfully, you have to be persistent. Um, antidepressant medicines, for example, can take weeks to work. Um, and I think in people with dementia, depression is both under and overdiagnosed. So it's underdiagnosed in that there's people that don't notice it at all because of these atypical presentations. And it's also overdiagnosed. People often tend to just give antidepressants to anybody with dementia who is tearful. And maybe there's a reason for it, like they just moved into a new assisted living or they lost their spouse or something. And so um, sometimes they're put on antidepressants that never really make any difference. So just as with any other powerful drug, there should be a good reason for using it. And there should be some way to decide if you think it's helping. And then after a certain point, if you think it's not, you'd want to take it away again. Next slide, please. Um, there are a number of other behavioral problems that come up in people with dementia. Uh, here are some general rules of thumb. You want to avoid arguments and direct conflict. You want to use humor and distraction and taking a break from things. So uh, if the person won't take their heart medicine, it's really important to take their heart medicine. If you say, you better take your heart medicine right now, that's probably not going to work out well. But the person may forget all about it five minutes later, and you say, okay, time for your medicine. They might cheerfully take a medicine that they just rejected five minutes ago. So you don't want to make everything a hill to die on. Somebody wants to wear a shirt and pants that don't match. Maybe that's not worth an argument. Um, and, uh, you know, what we think of psychosis, people that have delusions or have hallucinations, sometimes it's really just a misunderstanding and they, they don't really have hallucinations or delusions. They just don't remember the last conversation or that kind of thing. So you don't want to assume that somebody is psychotic uh, just because they believe things that aren't true. You know, they may just be mixed up about it. Um, try to create a full day for the for the person with a regular schedule, seven days a week, get up the same time, breakfast the same time. People do much better if they have a routine and they can just fall right into that routine. Um, consider an adult day program, uh, even if it's not every day. Um, sometimes people pay good money, for example, to have home care for someone with dementia, and the home care person is just watching the person sleep all day while they watch uh, soap operas. Um, and, and then after paying all that money, you come home and your relative is awake all night because they slept all day. Um, you know, a day program is not like that. There's activity going on the whole time. So somebody comes home that good kind of tired where they've been doing something. They had some fun. They had some stimulation. So that could be very helpful. And do what you can to avoid caregiver burnout. Get support from family and friends and consider whether somebody could spell you for a while. There, there are even nursing homes and assisted livings where a person can stay for just a few days so that their family can go on a vacation that they maybe couldn't do before. Um, next slide, please. Uh, here's another Ask Me Three. My father has dementia, and every time he misplaces something, he thinks it has been stolen and gets upset. So this is a little bit what I was mentioning before. So what is the problem? People with dementia sometimes misinterpret events and come to false conclusions because of the gaps in their memory. I can't find my wallet, so it must have been stolen. What do I need to do? Avoid arguing with or trying to correct him. Try to distract him with a pleasant activity while you find the missing object. Let's have some ice cream, and we'll look for your wallet. Uh, why is it important for me to do this? You're unlikely to be able to change his mind, and trying to make him, quote, listen to reason could be embarrassing and can escalate the situation. Next slide, please. Practical considerations. Uh, you want to think about driving safety. This can be a painful issue. Some people, driving is really wrapped up in their self-esteem. I'm not a very good driver, my wife will tell you, so that probably won't be a problem for me, but it's a problem for a lot of people. And sometimes, unfortunately, families have to take charge. 
uh, you know, sometimes they may have to report the person to the DMV and get their license suspended. They may have to disable or remove the car. They may have to lay down the law. Um, you know, you, you'd be in a better position to tell it. But, but I ask people, you know, uh, are you worried about your dad's driving? And they'll say, oh, I think it's kind of okay. And I'll say, let me ask you this. Would you let him pick the kids up from school? And they're like, oh, absolutely not. And I'm like, okay, well, if that's the case, then I think we know what you need to do. If if you wouldn't let him drive your children in the car, then how can you let him drive around someone else's children that might be playing in the street? Um, home safety and need for supervision. Some people with dementia are okay to be home alone for periods of time, although they probably shouldn't live totally alone unless they have someone checking in a lot. Um, but um, sometimes people need somebody there all the time if they wouldn't know what to do if the house caught fire or they wouldn't know what to do if a stranger rang the doorbell, that kind of thing. So there's in-home care, there are day programs, um, decision-making abilities. Uh, is the person still able to make financial decisions? Will somebody steal their money or take advantage of them? Um, will they be able to make decisions about medical issues? So you want to consider things like having the person choose someone to be their power of attorney, that is, pick someone in advance to make medical or financial decisions for them or some kind of a living will. And again, you don't want to wait till it becomes an emergency. If, if you've just been diagnosed with a mild case of dementia, it's very likely that you can still make these decisions for yourself. You can say what your wishes are uh, if you become disabled. You can pick who you'd want to be in charge of it. If you wait until the person can't do that anymore, then how are they going to ever express their wishes? So you have to plan for future needs. Next slide, please. Um, so that's all of the uh, all of the prepared material I have for you, and I would be happy to take some questions and answers in the time that we have. Dr. Rosenblatt, thank you so much. That was fantastic, and I can tell you we have quite a few people listening in to this, and there are also quite a number of questions. So let's get started. Okay. All right. All right. So you mentioned drugs that may help. Is and and someone says, yeah, I've read seven stages of Alzheimer's, seven stages of dementia. Is there a point of no return beyond which we know that the drugs won't help or should we try to get an intervention at any point, especially since sometimes people hide what's been going on or in denial? I, I don't really I think there's a point of no return. Um, some of the drugs have FDA approval all the way up through severe Alzheimer's disease. So you could think of mild as being somebody where you can tell that there's a problem, but they can still do most of their own activities, but they might trouble with the trickier things like financial stuff. You can think of moderate as somebody who probably can no longer do their, what we call their instrumental activities of daily living. That's uh, making phone calls, uh, um, uh, using the kitchen, you know, that kind of thing, but they can do their basic activities, dressing, bathing, feeding themselves. And then you could think of severe as somebody who needs hands-on care even for that. And so there are a couple of drugs that are approved all the way into severe. I think if somebody's condition is truly end stage, they're no longer responsive to their environment, they, they no longer eat, uh, you know, they're not likely to live much longer, then there's probably not much point in trying one of these medicines. But Anything short of that, I think, may be worth a try, um, and uh, the worst that can happen is it won't be effective. Um, sometimes people make the mistake of taking patients off their dementia medication when they go into an institutional setting. And, uh, you know, I've had doctors say to me, oh, well, you know, if he's going into a nursing home, he's going to assisted living, I failed, you know, what else can I do at this point? Well, um, you know, I have research data that shows that people that take treatment when they live in assisted living are more likely to be able to live out the rest of their life there instead of having to move to a higher level of care. Uh, like a nursing home, um, and it seems unfair to take away somebody's medicine that's enhancing their memory when they're just about to go into an unfamiliar environment. But, you know, I, I'm used to going into the nursing homes and the assisted living, so I see the other side of that of that gap. And if you don't normally follow patients into that, you just see those places as a black hole where people go to disappear. Well, they don't go there to disappear. They go there to live out the rest of their life. And the advertising for it says independence, uh, high quality of life, activity, stimulation. That's what those places are supposed to be offering people. And so we don't want to act like everything is over when somebody moves into that setting. All right. We have 32 questions. Oh, my goodness. I'm so going to be a lot briefer. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. 33 now. So we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but I will try to group them where I see that they are, you know, related. And one is about age. What's the youngest you've seen? And is 56. Would 56 be surprising? 
It wouldn't be surprising. It would be unusual. So there are certainly people unlucky enough to get Alzheimer's disease at age 56, and there are some uh, uh, versions of it that have young onset that run in families. Uh, I think the youngest person that I ever saw that had dementia was a guy who was about 29 who had frontotemporal dementia. That was unusual, but but not unheard of. But Alzheimer's disease, unfortunately, there are a fair number of people that can get it at 56, although that's certainly not common. Okay. There was something on the news this morning, someone says, about a potential medicine for a vaccine, actually, for Alzheimer's or dementia. Have you heard of this? And how promising does that seem? I'm not sure precisely what that's talking about, uh, but um, uh, they may be talking about amyloid. So in Alzheimer's disease, there's a chemical called amyloid that gets deposited in the brain. And most people think that has something to do with why the brain cells get sick and die. And so there's been talk about um, things that might uh, uh, somehow vaccinate people for amyloid and cause that to break down. But I don't know of a vaccine that's ready for public consumption or is right around the corner. You mentioned a neurologist and you mentioned a psychiatrist. Are those the people, the specialists that would diagnose dementia? Are there others? Can your primary care doc do it? Well, your primary care doctor certainly can do it. I didn't mean to give the to, to imply at all that they're not competent for that. Just that you know, in our general training, we don't receive a whole lot of instruction about how best to talk about it with people. But it is not that complicated a diagnosis, and somebody who asks appropriate questions and does a few studies can make an accurate diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And the vast majority of cases are diagnosed by people's primary care doctors. Um, but among the specialists in dementia that I've encountered, they tend to be psychiatrists, neurologists, or geriatricians, sometimes psychologists as well. So there are a few different people because I get asked, what's the best kind of doctor to see for dementia? And, and I think there really is no single right answer for that because in all of those fields, you have to find somebody who's got an interest in it and has seen a lot. Right. Can you explain the difference between primary progressive aphasia? I think I said that right and other types of dementia like Alzheimer's? I can. Primary progressive aphasia is a type of frontotemporal dementia, which was one of the ones that I alluded to that's, that's pretty rare. You know, it might only be 5% of the dementia cases in the U.S., something like that. And primary progressive aphasia is a subtype of that. Um, it's a very unfortunate condition where people, aphasia means uh, some neurologic inability to speak. And so people begin to have difficulty with speech, not difficulty making their mouth move, but coming up with the right words. Um, uh, you know, I had a guy with this condition and I showed him a stapler and I said, what's this called? And he said, uh, you use it to attach paper together, but he couldn't name the stapler. Um, and so he was unfortunately somebody that was developing it. And primary progressive aphasia turns into a more broader dementia uh, with a fairly rapid course uh, can be very debilitating. Um, and so it is a subtype of frontotemporal dementia, and fortunately it's quite rare. Uh, there aren't a lot of powerful treatments for it, but certainly if somebody has it and I've treated people with this condition, they benefit from support and advice and treatment for some of the other kinds of behavioral problems that can emerge. So question here, can vascular dementia, I guess, happen after a brain tumor? Uh, it could happen after a brain tumor because brain tumors can um, interfere with the blood supply uh, to the brain because they grow into blood vessels and they take up space. Or if the brain tumor is removed, that can cause some bleeding. So it wouldn't be the most common kind of vascular dementia, but it could happen uh, in relation to a brain tumor. Uh, there'd also be the issue of the brain tumor itself. How big is it and what was it pressing on in the brain? In some cases, brain tumors can cause a reversible type of dementia where after the tumor is taken out again, it's not pressing on things person may recover to a greater or lesser extent. Here's a question. It's interesting. We screen for so many things now in healthcare, and someone says, would there be added value in identifying and treating Alzheimer's disease by making some level of cognitive testing standard after a certain age? What Boy, is that a great question. Um, I, I, there are no treatments that are definitively shown to prevent the onset of Alzheimer's disease or, or change the underlying disease process. People are working very hard on them, and there are things that may be on the horizon, but all the treatments right now are symptomatic. So, you know, there's two different questions. There's the medical question. If I knew somebody was going to develop Alzheimer's disease or was showing very early signs, is there anything that I could do about it medically? 
And the answer is there's not a whole lot. But then there's the, 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 the life question, which is, would I want to know if I were developing early signs so that I could make decisions that were relevant to that? How do I want to spend my money? Where do I want to live? Do I want to retire? Do I want to stay at my job? Those kinds of things. Those might be very important to people. I can tell you that I don't think that there's any sort of national organization that has come down strongly on the side of early regular screening because there are these practical considerations. And so they usually want to wait for the person to have some kind of a complaint. I'm not sure I agree with that. If I were king of the world, I probably would create some kind of a screening process like that. Um, I think certainly in certain fields, that's more important. So if you're an airline pilot or you know, a president or something like that, uh, you probably should be evaluated more closely than the average person who can't do that much harm if they start to develop a, a cognitive problem. There are a couple of questions related to the heredity factor here. And one says, is it hereditary, which you've addressed. And then someone specifically says, I've read somewhere that the heredity may be just 1.2 to 2%. So could you comment? Sure. Um, it's hereditary in two different ways. Um, the, the 1 to 2% part is accurate in that um, there's a very small number of Alzheimer's cases that are strongly hereditary. And in fact, they tend to follow what's called an autosomal dominant pattern, which means that if you have it, each of your kids probably has a 50% chance of inheriting that, that bad gene. And that only makes up 1% to 2% of Alzheimer's cases. And there tends to be a, a very strong family history, usually in a, a relatively early onset. Um, everything else is what they call sporadic cases. And we know that um, if you have one parent with it, your risk is about double. If you have two parents with it, your risk is about fivefold. Um, but but it's probably based on a bunch of different genes um, that, that all kind of work together. And so they're not strongly hereditary. You can't make much of a prediction if somebody has a parent that just has the sporadic form of it. So both those statements are true. We're now up to 48 uh, questions. So we'll oh, never dear. get to all of this today. <laughs> but you can see the interest here. And obviously, these diseases are impacting a lot of people. So question, two questions here, or com comment and a question. We don't rely on memory very much anymore because we have technology. So is it becoming harder to diagnose short-term memory issues because of that? I don't think it's becoming harder to diagnose them because you need quite a bit of cognitive power to, to use this technology as well. Uh, but I do think that technology can help us with the treatment and, and assistance of people with Alzheimer's disease because we have all these wonderful technological marvels. We have things like machines that dispense medication at the right time. We have things like uh, closed circuit uh, cameras so family members can check on uh, their relatives with dementia on a regular basis using a webcam or something like that. So I think technology has much to offer us to make life better for people with dementia, but I don't, I don't think it's made it harder to diagnose. And, and audience, forgive me, but I'm, I'm going to uh, move past the questions that are very specific and individual to things that are, um, you know, have greater implication for all of our listeners. So here's one about particular medications. Is it true that after eight to 10 years on memantine and Donazole, it's no longer a viable treatment? And then related, are there any medicines that are deemed to increase dementia? Uh, okay, uh, so that's kind of two different questions. I, I don't agree that after eight to 10 years, it's no longer viable. We don't have any scientific reason to believe that it stops working. What happens is that these treatments probably don't change the underlying disease process. They improve the efficiency of the remaining parts of the brain. And so they improve your cognitive performance, maybe your behavior, maybe your functional abilities to an extent, but they don't change the fact that you're still losing these brain cells. And so eventually the person will decline cognitively, but not as badly as they would be doing if they weren't on the treatment. We have data out to about three years and we don't have data that goes out that far to be able to say whether these two curves, you know, remember that slide that showed the, the placebo curve and the, and the treatment curve, do they converge at some point? Is there a point where the medicine can't make any difference between them anymore? There's no study that goes out that far to show that they converge. So I, I wouldn't automatically stop using it after a certain amount of time. That having been said, most people don't have eight to 10 years to live if they have Alzheimer's disease, because number one, they were probably old when they got it, and so they usually die of, of some other competing cause associated with old age. Um, and if you really had Alzheimer's disease for eight to 10 years, it might get so bad that, that the Alzheimer's disease itself could, could lead to your death because you might not be able to eat or move anymore. So uh, um, 
Um, but I wouldn't say that they that they stop working or that you should that you should uh, automatically withdraw it. Um, and um, I don't know that there are medications that can give you Alzheimer's disease, but there are certainly medications that can impair your cognitive function and and make you perform worse. Uh, you know, um, any medicine that can cause delirium, so uh, excessive use of sleeping pills, pain medication, things that your body doesn't metabolize well can can worsen your condition. So here's a question, and there are several for help. So how do you deal with an individual? They're an adult. They have rights. You know, they want to be independent, may not be able to drive, you know, can't live alone. How do you talk to them about getting help? How do you get them there? Well, it's tough, and some of it depends on what kind of personality the person had in the first place and what their relationship is like with their family. There's a lot of reversal. So I remember saying to a guy, uh, your dad isn't taking his medication. you got to do something about it. And he said, you don't understand. That's my dad. I can't just order him to take his medication. You know, he tells me what to do. We've always had the opposite relationship. Or sometimes the person was really the dominant one in the in the spousal relationship. You know, they were the one who paid the bills and made the investment decisions. And now the spouse has to take over those things. So there can be a lot of awkwardness. Um, but I think... Uh, um, you know, you you try to emphasize the positive things that can come out of it. If you if you give up, uh, you know, handling the bills, think of all the extra time you're going to have to spend with your grandchildren and to pursue that hobby that you wanted to spend time on. Uh, you know, uh, I'm going to get you a, a um, help getting. I'm going to get you transportation, get you all the places you need to live, uh, and now you won't have to worry about taking care of the car anymore. You know, try to emphasize the positive part of it. Sometimes, unfortunately, you may have to force the issue and. Families may have to get um, guardianship in the most extreme cases where a judge actually declares the person incompetent and hands the decision making to someone else, usually a family member. Uh, sometimes you may have to report something to the DMV or have a car removed, you know, in a situation like that. You know, you've got to do what's safe, uh, and there are various legal ways to do it. But I think trying to be loving and supportive and emphasize the positive and, and come with solutions and not only problems. So if you say, you've got to stop driving, but the person lives in a rural area and they're, you know, 10 minutes from the nearest convenience store, well, that's not going to be very acceptable to them. So you have to come up with a way that they're going to be able to live their life. So someone says, I have a sister who was recently diagnosed with early onset in her 50s. Are there support groups that you're aware of looking for some help here? There are support groups. I would suggest getting in touch with your local Alzheimer's Association. Uh, uh, but I have friends at Johns Hopkins uh, that uh, work in early forms of dementia. And there are some support groups and support organizations for people with early onset, both for the people themselves and for their family members. And there are some support groups for people with some of the rarer forms of dementia. Uh, here's a question. Is it normal for an individual with dementia to begin thinking that they don't like things like food that they did like before? It's not uncommon. People's preferences may change. They may become kind of negativistic and tend to reject things. Sometimes they develop a taste for the most rewarding types of food. So I've seen people that will stop eating, you know, healthy meals and only want to eat sweets and they begin to exist on a diet of cookies and donuts and ice cream and things like that. Again, if the person has a short life expectancy up to a point, you might not worry about it. You might say it's bringing them pleasure and, uh, you know, it's actually improving their quality of life. But obviously, if, if it's compromising their health, say they have diabetes and they want to eat nothing but ice cream, that can be difficult to get around. Uh, so I've certainly seen changes in people's food preferences before. A couple of last questions here, and, and, and then I'll give some more information for everyone. If and there are two related questions. Someone says, I keep going with my parent to the primary care doc, and the doc says, we're doing everything that they need. We don't need to um, diet, give them medications for dementia. And then someone else says, how do you suggest acquiring a diagnosis or treatment if the primary care doc is not diagnosing? What do you recommend people do in those kinds of circumstances? Well, in that case, I think it might be time to see, well, you could see another primary care doc, but I think it could be time to see a specialist. Um, there are um, a number of memory clinics in the greater Baltimore area. So, for example, there's one at University of Maryland downtown. There's one that Johns Hopkins runs out of the uh, Bayview campus, a memory center there, and you can find these by looking on the internet. 
um, uh, you could take the person to see a neurologist or, or a geriatric psychiatrist and see if you can get a definitive diagnosis. Uh, you know, if you think something's being missed, I, I think you should do it. And, you know, as to when or, uh, it's time to start medication, uh, I tend to be a believer in those medications. And so I'd probably be you know, more likely than not to do it if there's not some contraindication. I don't think there's a magical time to wait, but to do that, you need to start with an accurate diagnosis. This has been great, Dr. Rosenblatt, and we certainly thank you for imparting such important information that's obviously of, of concern to so many people. Uh, let me tell the audience, if I can have the next slide, please, that um, several of you have asked, are the slides available? The slides will be able to be seen, as well as the entire presentation again, if you want to go to ums.org slash let's talk. And they should be up there in about 48 hours. And again, we've had more than 50 questions. We will try to um, provide some additional answers to questions that were not addressed at all. And that may take a little bit longer, but Dr. Rosenblatt has agreed to do that in case we had so many questions. And I can tell you, audience, there have been more questions in this session than I've seen in the last 18 months or so. So obviously, there's need out there and real concern. As well, if you go to that website, you'll be able to look at any of the other sessions that we've had throughout this series. And there are the topics that are there um, listed for you are on your screen. Next slide. And next month, our topic, and this one I expect will be another one of real interest, which is long COVID, people who are suffering effects of COVID for an exceedingly long time, as well as the pediatric COVID vaccine. And that will be December 15th, again, at 12 o'clock. So join us for that. I want to thank you again, Dr. Rosenblatt. And we will, as I mentioned, try to get you more information and deal with some of the other questions that we have here. So thank you, everyone, for your time today. Thanks for having me.